I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, Communications Director for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. His website, icba.ca. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim. Canada right now has a record low number of EI recipients. And I'm just wondering if we have so few people collecting EI, shouldn't employers and employees start paying record low premiums? Well, wouldn't that be a big change uh, in government? You're absolutely right. EI, uh, our unemployment numbers have plummeted. We are at um, you know, nearly what economists term full employment uh, in several provinces, including British Columbia. Uh, the labor market's never been uh, never been better. If if you want a job, there's a job out there for you. Um, it may not be in precisely the field you want, but you know there's certainly work out there for a- anyone who would who would like to seek it. Um, but you're right. The problem is, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like the government has has, uh, has connected that in in their mind. So EI is as expensive as ever. In fact, I think they increased it last year. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what their rationale or, or their reason is, but we're seeing this with a number of kind of costs and fees to doing business in in British Columbia and in Canada. You know, for example, WorkSafe BC is sitting on uh, sitting on a, a surplus that you know is about 80 percent more than they actually need to make sure that uh, all claims are paid out and everything's taken care of. But there's no move to return that money to uh, the employers who have been paying it. So at a time where affordability is the number one issue, where people are trying to find ways to make their paycheck stretch farther, and where employers are trying to find ways to deal with growing government costs, uh, you know, EI, WorkSafe BC, those are two pots of money that uh, perhaps government should be looking at returning to the people. Is there a suspicion these are being used as cash cows? Yeah, well, the WorkSafe BC one's interesting because well, you know, legally it has to stay within WorkSafe BC. Um, you know, it's an insur- it basically it's an insurance company, so they want to make sure that they have something like 120% uh, of what they need to, to pay out every claim if every claim came through. They're more, I, I think, at 170 or 180%, like is what we last saw, which tells you that they're sitting on too much money. Now, other provinces, I think Alberta and Saskatchewan, have both in recent years returned some of their work safe equivalent of monies to employers. But uh, British Columbia, it seems highly unlikely given the NDP and their... Um, uh, distaste for uh, small business and, and how tone deaf they are to the concerns of businesses. Are you going to pressure them to return some of that money? Yeah, there's a, a number of reviews going on. One of them is a WorkSafe BC review, and it is a point that's been made to them. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Chances are they'll see there's more of an opportunity to add more red tape and more problems for uh, employers rather than uh, rather than seeing it as a path to, to maybe help employers remain competitive. Um, the one thing I would say on the EI numbers is it's good right now but there are many 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 storm clouds on the economic horizon uh, not the least of which is hurricane trump in the states and and what's happening there as far as um, trade tariffs and what that could do to rising or to increase costs of various materials and and supplies in canada you you have um you have the uh very cold shoulder that the bc government is giving to natural resource development uh, that could be problematic. So there are storm clouds on the horizon, and, and we need to make sure that we're mindful that we are full, virtually full employment today, and we may not be so lucky a year from now. Uh, Canada's economy, I don't know, it just feels like you know, there's something percolating on the surface here, and then something bad might be about to happen. We talked about this in the past. Your association is facing a labor shortage right now. What's being done to correct it? Well, what we're trying to do is uh, talk up the trades to uh, young people. So, you know, obviously construction is a bit of a young person's game. I mean, you have to be, you know, physically fit and, and able to do the work. Um, one of the things that we've been very dismayed of uh, the, the NDP and the Green Party, and frankly the Liberals too when they're in power, is 
there was a little bit of uh, looking down their nose at, at trades as a as a career. And you always hear about, you know, what are we going to do to encourage high tech and you know, software and clean tech companies and you know, green and you know all all those kind of things, white collar jobs essentially. Um, but there isn't that same kind of respect given to trades uh, employees. You know, Andrew Weaver probably being the worst the way he looks down at construction uh, construction workers and, and what they do. Yet it's 10 percent of the provincial economy, nine, uh, 250,000 people work in construction. So the first thing we need to do is have our politicians, our business leaders, quit talking bad about you know a career in the trades. If you're an entrepreneur and you're physically fit. You can make a lot of money entering the trades. You start out, uh, you know, apprenticing. You work with a company. You learn the trade. You become an expert. You start your own crew. You start your own company. Before you know it, um, you're, you're making uh, very good money. So, you know, we need to educate parents. Uh, we need to educate teachers and and, uh, and politicians and other business leaders that trades aren't a fallback. Uh, you know, they're not just for you know the kids who love to do woodwork or metal shopping in school. Therefore, lots of people, uh, especially those with entrepreneurial, uh, entre- entrepreneurial events. Do they have a totally different attitude in Europe? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar enough with the uh, European uh, construction uh, market there. Um, you know, it just it, it, it just bothers us that you know trade sometimes it seems like the fallback uh, rather than as a uh, career of choice. Um, there's lots of opportunities. There's many programs. There's programs, you know, supporting women in trades and First Nations in trades and, and you know, promoting trades to high school students and all those different things. Uh, you know, all of us in the trades, not just, you know, ICBA, but, you know, the progressive unions like CLAC and CWU, the employee associations, even the building trades unions who, uh, you know, we disagree with on many, many things. Um, you know, we're all trying to find that, you know, that, that thing that will help attract more people, more people, more kids to the trades. Um, but it's, you know, basically a, a lot of it's a cultural mindset, and that's what we need to tackle first. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Welcome back. We're talking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, are there concerns in your association about the perhaps future of BC fish farming? Now, we were actually very alarmed to hear the announcement this week from the NDP government that you know, within four years they will close fish farms or, or not renew licenses um, based on whether or not they have a sign off from a, a local First Nation. And, and here's why. Look, you know, we're not in the fish farm business. Uh, you know, fish farms have a little bit of construction attached to them, but not a ton. But what people don't understand is that fish farms operate under uh, a licensing or a leasing agreement with the province of British Columbia. There are tens of thousands, you know, maybe as many as a hundred thousand different leases in BC. So British Columbia is something like 95 or 97 percent crown land. So any business operating on those crown lands need to have some sort of agreement with the province, the provincial government, on what to do. So if you're a forestry company, it's to cut wood. If you're a mining company, it's to dig in the ground. Um, heck, tourism operations have to have leases uh, with the, you know, it, it just kind of runs the gamut. It really is the underpinning of the um, British Columbia economy. Now you have John Horgan coming out and saying, you know what, on fish farms, uh, First Nations, it's not enough just to consult with them. You, it's not enough to even have an agreement with them. You, you have to have their absolute consent, They're essentially giving First Nations a veto over um, – over first, over fish farms. This is a big problem. So, you know, as we've discussed before, you know, no first nation, I'm not sure there's very many pieces of land in BC where only one first nation has a claim on. Uh, most claims overlap. You can have two, three, four, five first nations claiming the same piece of land. 
And what John Horgan is saying is that you have to have the agreement with every single one of those First Nations uh, that have just a claim on that land to um, before you can operate. Uh, it doesn't matter that fish farms, that there's, you know, 20 First Nations agreements in place already. It doesn't matter that 80% of the salmon that, that come out of it um, are done so with partnerships with First Nations. It doesn't matter that, you know, the vast majority of employees in many of these fish farms are First Nations. If one other First Nation doesn't like it, it can be shut down. And, you know, that should be very, very concerning to, you know, the tens of thousands of other companies, businesses that have leases with the province. Do you feel that the current BC government is sending out the message, we're closed to business, forget it if you want to open something new? Yeah, I, I do believe that. They, it seems to be a message that they send over and over again. I mean, you know, I'm not sure what the next big project that would come to British Columbia is. Like, you know, LNG Canada might, might, and hopefully, fingers crossed, might be far, far enough down the track that they uh, keep going. But, you know, if they're, you know, if you're a new business looking to come into BCI, I'm not sure why you would. Like, you, you just, there's so many hurdles being put up by this government, whether it's the hurdles to Trans Mountain, which, you know, had provincial approval and they tore it up, uh, whether it's Site C, their own project that they slowed down and reviewed. Um, you know, why would you, why would you come into that? Whether it's the fact that they seem more than willing to allow the activists and the First Nations, uh, you know, the ones that, you know, the ones that seem to disagree with everything rather than, you know, empowering the ones that, you know, see uh, see business as an opportunity to, to grow their local economies and, and lift their people out of poverty. It just boggles my mind that this is where John Horgan, who, you know, by all accounts was a blue-collar guy, trades guy who came through, uh, who's from the wing of the party that believed in economic growth, it boggles my mind that this is where John Horgan has gone. So do you believe the bananas are, are taking over, build absolutely nothing around anyone anywhere? Yeah, I do, I do. This is... This is really about activist government, kind of winning the battle versus responsible fact-based government. And it's, it's really disturbing. I mean, fish farms are not as small, uh, are not as small as you have billion and a half dollars in revenue, 6,600 jobs BC-wide. Uh, more than half the fish eaten in the world come out of fish farms. Like, these are important, this is an important industry, um, for the future. And it's, it's the lack of facts that drive me crazy, right? Like, these activists get up, like Alexander Morton, and they claim that, oh, you know, they're spreading lice, they're spreading disease. You know, in 2011, she claimed that, uh, or 2009, uh, there was a claim that, you know, they were spreading this disease to wild salmon. It was thoroughly disproven, but no one ever reports that. Um, you know, in the past eight years, we've seen four of BC's best salmon runs ever. Record run of pink salmon in 2013, a record run of sockeye in 2010, and then again in 2014, and a record run of chum and salmon in 2016. Like, we've had four of BC's best wild salmon runs in the past eight years, and yet, you know, we're being told by, we're being told by these activists that no, no, the whole thing's on the verge of collapse. It just, it, it doesn't line up with the facts, but, you know, Lana Popham and John Horgan go along with the activists and off they go. Do you feel they do a lack of research deliberately? Oh, totally. Look, Lana Popham's made no secret. Alexander Morton's her friend. Her, you know, she's an activist. She's been fighting these for 30 years. Um, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I don't think they've done it. You know, you had Lana Popham stand up, and you know, if you recall at the very beginning, and write a letter accusing the uh, Ministry of Agriculture's Animal Health Center of being in a conflict of interest on fish farm, thoroughly disproven by the Premier's own deputy minister. And, you know, Lana Popham just kind of, you know, wanders on and, you know, six months later imposes a new, you know, restrictions on fish farms. It, it really is amazing that she's even in cabinet still after that blunder at the beginning. And again, you know, John Horgan, if you're out there listening to this, like, understand, like, the blue-collar workers that you supposedly stand up for and, and work for and want to represent and want more of in British Columbia, you're harming them by, you know, making it, uh, by basically tearing up agreements and, you know, putting all these uh, thousands of leases in jeopardy. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after the break. 
Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp. Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, my real estate experts, including Ross Kay, have told us that the market is naturally cooling down in real estate but yet the B.C. government thought it had to slap massive taxes on real estate. What's been the effect in the construction industry? Yeah, well, we haven't uh, seen a slowdown yet in construction, although many people think it's coming. Um, we have seen a few projects get canceled, though, especially in the Okanagan. Uh, speculation tax there has been a, a big concern in West Kelowna, and Kelowna has led to a couple of projects being abandoned. Um, look, I can tell you, like, we had our house on the market in the uh, past month in Langley. Um, and then we were looking for another place. We've actually taken it off the market. There's no imperative for us to move. The market has completely melted. Um, people are waiting to see. They don't know the effect of these taxes. They don't know where the hell the NDP are going with them. They're worried about it. So they're basically sitting on their money and sitting on their assets and waiting to see what happens. I believe the NDP will come, will run a deficit uh, government this year. I believe they will not be able to meet their goals because I think they've grossly overestimated the amount of property transfer tax they, they thought they'd bring in. Um, and right now the market is cratering and there's no way they're going to be able to bring in that kind of deal. Well, also too, if people are scared to build holiday homes for people, what does that say about BC as a tourist destination? Well, wow, this is a big problem. So in the Okanagan especially, a lot of Albertans have bought property over the years. They've moved in. You know, they spend a, a period of, uh, you know, every year there. Uh, it's a family kind of home. Uh, and now you, they're being told, no, no, you guys stay out. That combined with the VC government's just absolute travesty of the way it's handled the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline and the way they've just slapped Alberta money in the face uh, and Albertans in the face over and over again. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if tourism numbers from Alberta are way down this year as well. Like, if you're a tourist from Alberta, why would you go to British Columbia and support the economy of a, a government that hates everything about you and where you get your money from? So it, it, it's really disturbing to see what's going on. And, you know, again, it, it all lays at the feet of one guy, and, and that's John Horgan. And uh, I, I just don't understand the kind of British Columbia he's trying to, he's trying to create here. Well, with Alberta being our closest Canadian province, do we not get the majority of our Canadian tourists from there? You would think so. Certainly with the number of Albertans who travel into the Okanagan or into the Kootenays. Uh, but, you know, this year we've heard anecdotal reports from tourism agencies in Kelowna, in, um, in the Kootenays, saying, you know, Albertans have canceled the trips. They're not coming because they, uh, they resent the way that British Columbia treated the pipeline. And all of these decisions, this is the thing about government that's different than opposition. In opposition, you can say whatever you want, you can attack whatever you want, you can criticize whatever you want. In government, every decision you make has consequences, both intended and unintended. And when John Horgan sold his soul to Andrew Weaver and promised to do whatever it took to stop the pipeline, the unintended consequence of that was completely destroying our relationship with Alberta to the point where we had an inter-Canadian trade war and now, you know, Albertans staying home. And, and that really is the unfortunate thing that, you know, this NDP government has not learned to better measure their words and measure the things that they plan to do uh, to make sure that they're not harming the economy. Were there concerns when Carol James became the finance minister? Because I remember in the past, most of their speeches kind of bordered on eat the rich. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's exactly what they want to do is they, you know, it's mind boggling like, the number of things that they've stacked up against people who they perceive as being wealthy. And, you know, frankly, who who aren't really all that wealthy. Like, two married teachers 
uh, you know, experienced teachers in the in the school system. Two married teachers would be considered, you know, wealthy and worthy of being punished by higher taxes by this government. Like, I, I don't really understand that. If you're if you're a cop and you're married to a um, a teacher, are you really in the elite one percent that should be punished? Like to me, that's pretty middle class, right? Like uh, that that to me is is not the kind of tax uh, tax system that makes a lot of sense. Jordan, thanks a lot for being on the show. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Communications Director for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. His website, icba.ca. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Questions for the show or our guests can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.